stream number 78. All right, very good. That being said, we will get started. All right, so let's go live. And we're going live, and we're going live, and we're going live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to live stream number 78 of the Data on Kubernetes community. As you can see, I'm not in my usual place. I am in Madrid, all right, the capital city of Spain, and I'm joined today by someone who's in a completely different country, but we'll get to that in a second. Before we get started, just usual regular stuff. Welcome to everybody who's here. Very excited about today's session. We'll also be having another session later on tonight about Apache Pulsar. Um, but before we get into that, um, just want to remind everybody, we have our KubeCon co-located event coming up on October 12th, and you can be a part of it. Our CFP is open until next week on September 1st, and then it will be closed. I will link the CFP right here. There are two fundamental pieces of criteria that you have to keep in mind if you would like to give a talk in our KubeCon co-located event. A, it has to be a talk that's centered on working with stateful workloads on Kubernetes. We're talking about databases, operators, machine learning, some of the stuff that Kevin's gonna be talking about today. And the other thing that's very important for us is that you bring in an end user focus. We want to avoid strict, you know, vendor pitches. And we really want about this to be about seeing technology being applied in context um, with, with an end user in mind. So if you have those things, you know, going for you, you can definitely submit a talk. It can be 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45, even an hour long, depending on the kind of content you want to be focusing on. But just keep those things in mind. If you have any questions, you know where to find us. You can find us on Twitter, you can find us on LinkedIn, you can always jump in our Slack. Um, but like I said, today kicking off live stream number 78, I'm joined by Kevin, who's very active in the cloud native ecosystem. We were just talking about this before we got started, about different events that he's uh, organizing, participating in, as well as the fact that he will be giving a couple of talks in KubeCon. Um, so that being said, Kevin, welcome to the Data on Kubernetes community. It's very nice to have you with us here. Can you just tell us a little bit about your background uh, where you're from, what you're doing, and how you started working with Kubernetes. Hi, everyone. I'm very uh, happy to uh, join in the uh, uh, live today. Um, actually, I, uh, I'm i from uh, Hangzhou, China, a beautiful city. And actually, I started working uh, with the uh, Kubernetes uh, in the 2015, so quite early days. Uh, yeah. And actually, early, early days, I uh, focused on the scheduling stuff uh, in the upstream community. So if you are using uh, features like node affinity, part affinity, tense tolerations, you may uh, uh, benefit from my contribution. You can, say, you can say thank you to Kevin if you're using those. That's important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, uh, uh, during uh, our work uh, when uh, serving our customers, we also found that uh, Kubernetes is not just uh, uh, enough, especially when we are adopting more, um, uh, adopting the cloud native technologies to more industries. Mm -hmm. So uh, in 2018, uh, I started the Cube Edge project. It's also an, a project uh, focusing on edge computing under CNCF. And the uh, Volcano project I'm going to talk about it today, uh, we started in uh, actually uh, 2019 as a uh, open source project. And this one is actually uh, trying to uh, help people running better the uh, AI, machine learning, uh, big data workloads on Kubernetes. Okay, very good. Going back to the Cube Edge thing, if you guys also before we got started with the live stream, it seems like that's a really hot topic. And what is it that Kubernetes and Edge, you know, that combination that's, that has so much potential that people are really excited about, what is it that makes it so special and is getting a lot of attention right now? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, that Kubernetes was uh, designed for data centers. So it uh, requires like more, uh, more resources and the more uh, reliable underlying uh, networking. And also the, uh, the, the assumptions that uh, all the uh, components and the services, the applications are running with this, uh, at least uh, the wired network. Mm -hmm. But in the age, on the edge is very different. So the nodes, uh, the, the sites may be highly uh, distributed and the network uh, between each edge sites and also uh, the network between the edge to the data center are very uh, limited with uh, maybe uh, low uh, bandwidth or high uh, latency. So we need to, uh, first of all, deal with that and make the edge site able to run uh, autonomously uh, when they are disconnected with the cloud. 
And at this, at mean, uh, at the same time, uh, there are a lot of uh, services in, already in the cloud. So we think that in the early days, we still need to benefit from the services ecosystem in the cloud. So Cubage was actually uh, trying to uh, help people achieve the cloud edge collaboration uh, architecture easier. All right, very good. And then with that in mind as well too, we've seen this development with edge, you've been working with Kubernetes since 2015. That's not that common. You know, it's like the human resources people that ask for 10 years of Kubernetes experience, but you've got, <laughs> you've got six years of experience under your belt. Dude. Like that, that's, that's saying something. And this is something mm -hmm. that we talk a lot about in our community because we are the data on Kubernetes community. And I believe it was in yeah. 2015, 2016 was when, and you'll remember this better than me for sure, the arrival of uh, stateful sets. And so sort of, yeah. you know, building out this sort of pathway in different ways um, for the sort of approach towards making running data on Kubernetes. One of the things that have helped making running data on Kubernetes easier. Having started in 2015 and where we're at now in 2021, do you feel like Kubernetes is becoming more and more or better and better prepared to be working with data on Kubernetes? What do you think are still some of the challenges that have to be solved? Where are we at right now compared to then when you started? Well, I think actually uh, from the Kubernetes itself, the uh, for example, the, the scope of the core, actually, uh, I would say that a state of set was not that um, popular as people expected uh, because there are a lot of uh, limitation on making just the one API to support the various of uh, workloads. So, uh, but uh, the model of the uh, operator and this customer resource definition uh, helped a lot in the, in, the, in the journey. So actually today we can see a lot of people are trying to run the uh, especially the uh, state for workloads on Kubernetes. And what we are working on is uh, we are trying to help like the, uh, the computing intensive workloads running on Kubernetes. So I think it's actually, um, I would say it's kind of, we have done almost the half of the work. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, one of the barrier is that, uh, for example, uh, a lot of people uh, run multiple types of workload on Kubernetes because they want to improve the uh, resource utili uh, utility. Uh, with that, actually, we are expecting uh, maybe we can support like the resource over subscription and uh, better the uh, management between the uh, online services and the uh, uh, batch workloads or, or offline uh, services sort of things. And uh, uh, regarding the data, I think some people are also trying to run like the uh, databases on uh, Kubernetes and also uh, even you, uh, cloud native storage projects are coming out. Uh, but I would say the, like the true backend of the uh, storage of the data, that part uh, still uh, is challenging to make it complete, uh, completely uh, containerized. But mm -hmm. there are actually in, in, in each uh, system like the database where storage, there are a lot of sort of uh, control plan of the data plan. So that part can be, uh, I would say uh, that part is uh, more easier to be containerized. And uh, uh, there are a lot of people already uh, running them in the containers. Good, good. And that's precisely it. This is, this is, it's very refreshing to hear that from someone who has the experience that you have of seeing how things are going. And, and there have been different reasons as to why things have, you know, go at the speed at which they're going. And we, we understand that this is somewhat, you know, uh, still an adoption period where, where more folks are learning how to do this both on the vendor side as well as on the end user side. And that's why, once again, we're really trying to incorporate this end user side. It's great to see a technology from a vendor perspective, but when it's actually applied in context for the end user, and we really get to see the challenges that they have of making that work. And so we see that, you know, in terms of use cases, edge seems to be a big one, financial services seems to be a significant one, healthcare, any, you know, where we're talking about large, large, large amounts of data, um, or we're seeing this to be more and more common. But today, we're going to be taking a look at uh, a Volcano, and in the description of, of, the, of the talk, 
We saw some other things that we've, we've heard about before, actually quite recently about TensorFlow, um, but curious to hear more about PyTorch as well as MPI. So with that, um, Kevin, if you want, you can uh, share your screen. We can jump right into the presentation. Oh, yes. Uh, can you see my desktop? Yes, I can. Perfect. Uh, so I, I, I'm going back to, uh, actually, I'm going to introduce uh, the uh, Volcano project and how uh, it can leverage the AI big, big data workload running better on Kubernetes. So one, just a little bit about the uh, background of the uh, uh, big data AI and also the HPC. So uh, actually in the early days, uh, people are more focusing on just the like finding the right place to run some of the tasks, right? That's actually the, the simple, uh, simplest uh, the, uh, definition of scheduling. But actually uh, in the early days, uh, like the HPC and the, uh, the, the big data, they all have different uh, software stack. The, the, the technology uh, uh, teams are, are isolated. They uh, all have their own uh, projects. So, um, but uh, going into the uh, like twenty uh, health, uh, you can see there are more uh, projects coming out. Like in the HPC, um, Yarn uh, become uh, more popular, and actually still uh, uh, many people are using it today. And also, like in the HPC, there are uh, SGE, and also uh, going to the uh, twenty fourteen the Spark. The streaming are uh, becoming the more uh, popular, and also uh, after 2015, more and more uh, AI frameworks coming out. And actually, today we can see it's going to uh, coming together. Like the uh, more and more people trying to move the HPC uh, workloads onto Kubernetes, and uh, also the framework. Actually, there there are more and more projects uh, like framework for running uh, frameworks. For example, Kubeflow could support um, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and the, uh, also the other uh, uh, frameworks, uh, and also the uh, MPI workloads. So uh, from this uh, kind of history, we can see that we can see that actually the long-term topics uh, during the development is actually people are focusing on uh, the scheduling efficiency. How to make the system schedule nodes faster and faster, and also how to improve the whole uh, infrastructure uh, infrastructure uh, resource utility, and also uh, from the uh, kind of the resource planning uh, perspective. Uh, in the early days, we can see uh, we can say uh, see that people have maybe dedicated resource pool for the online services. And also have their uh, uh, dedicated setup for the HPC workloads and also uh, AI and the, the big data each may have the, its own setup. It's kind of uh, very uh, expensive on the uh, managing and the operating them. But uh, today we can see more and more people are trying to unify the software stack and also unify the underlying uh, resource pool. And uh, of course, the benefit is, is very uh, obvious that we can uh, improve the resource uh, utility by uh, like uh, uh, running some of the offline uh, workloads uh, in the night, right? And also uh, for the uh, service deployment, uh, like in the early days, actually there are a lot of uh, standalone uh, upper layer uh, frameworks were, were the uh, the middle uh, uh, like the blue layers to to help running uh, the <clears throat> different uh, service work, uh, service types, but uh, today there are more and more projects trying to uh, to support multiple of the uh, types so they can uh, mix the online services, the offline analysis, uh, computing uh, workloads better together. And then uh, deal with the resource dynamic allocation uh, much uh, smarter. 
All right, and also the technology, we can see that uh, uh, in, in, in the early days, even though we have uh, uh, SGE, the uh, Spark or Yarn, but there are still a lot of uh, in-house work to customize their own uh, the, uh, uh, batch computing uh, platform. But today, uh, more and more people are just embarrassing their uh, the cloud native technology or based on the open source. That's quite exciting. And we we have the unified uh, underlying technology stack. We can spend more of our efforts on the uh, customization and uh, uh, doing more uh, research or, or try uh, new things. So, uh, Kubernetes is definitely the most important thing uh, in, in in the whole uh, in the whole journey, and uh, especially in the media the the media and the streaming uh, industry, uh, like the net uh, netly uh, uh, Netflix and also the the top streaming uh, companies in China, the enter uh, internet enterprises are or started uh, using the container technologies to run for example the uh, the streaming the uh, the conversion and also the uh, slicing to uh, do the uh, video processing and also the big data and the AI uh, we can see a lot of uh, people are just uh, moving their uh, from their uh, legacy uh, uh, stack to the uh, cloud native one to benefit from the uh, scalable uh, architecture and uh, the massively uh, parallel computing. And also uh, in the research, uh, in the research era, uh, we can see a lot of people, uh, a, lot, a lot of organization, CERN and the Monsanto and also the, uh, the bioinformatics uh, organizations, they are uh, moving from HPC to uh, container technologies, trying to build the new platform to simplify the, especially the software uh, dependency and also the uh, software uh, complexity management. Um, but uh, what we can see, there are still a lot of uh, challenges when adopting uh, the cloud natives to support the batch workloading uh, the the compute in intensive uh, workload uh, because uh, we can see that in the earlier uh, system, for example, the YARN, the HPC, the uh, SV, there are a lot of uh, advanced uh, job management concept and also uh, like uh, the scheduling are more from the job level. But today in Kubernetes itself, uh, it's, uh, the the model is just the schedule every part every part and the, uh, people are uh, the scheduler is unaware of the upper layer of the workload so that uh, makes some difficulty when you have some uh, requirement about the uh, from the job level for example I want this set of parts running together like of that. And also the scheduling uh, policies are limited, especially uh, like fair sharing among different uh, workloads and uh, fair sharing among different users. And also uh, we know that for Kubernetes, it's, it's actually just the, the best uh, decision at the scheduling time. Uh, it, it doesn't take the, uh, time plan like the future thing into consider consideration and also uh, don't balance with the uh, big work uh, heavy workload and the small workloads actually small workloads get kind of uh, implicit uh, higher uh, priority because the smaller uh, parts always easier to get uh, always easier to uh, succeed in scheduling. So we need to uh, deal with that. And also 
uh, if you are heavily uh, using the underlying uh, uh, the, the hardware accelerator, uh, like the uh, CPU and the IO topology, for example, Numar awareness, uh, they are, uh, the current support of Kubernetes are uh, limited. And also uh, for people running multiple uh, workloads on Kubernetes, um, you can find out that, for example, uh, almost every framework have, has its own operators, but uh, too many operators uh, becomes a problem because uh, you still need to spend some effort on managing and operating these operators, uh, the operators. So uh, this, uh, this is also challenging and especially the requirements varies from different frameworks. So uh, it's kind of similar uh, situation in the early days when people are trying to uh, run different types of workload uh, on top of Mesos. But Mesos is uh, using uh, kind of this uh, model, two level scheduling. It has it, uh, frameworks for each kind of workloads and they have the underlying resource management. But later on the uh, different frameworks come into uh, in competition with each other to uh, trying to get more resources. So we need to uh, balance uh, the resource allocation also uh, between the uh, frameworks to to uh, try to find a way easier to make this uh, workload uh, easier running uh, together inside one uh, cluster or inside one uh, resource pool. And also uh, for the uh, underlying the resource, uh, the, the planning and also the, uh, the uh, heterogeneous resource management, uh, we actually are uh, looking for more advanced features. So uh, uh, especially uh, more and the people, more and more people are trying to uh, uh, run workloads on uh, ARM-based architectures uh, together with x86. So we need to uh, uh, get more uh, information about the underlying uh, hardware, especially the advanced functionalities, and make the uh, system able to manage the uh, resources as well as the uh, advance the functionalities and uh, make use of them to better serve the player workloads. Um, that's why we uh, started working on a Volcano project. So uh, so uh, it's actually the, uh, it's the first, uh, first uh, open source cloud native uh, batch computing uh, uh, platform. Uh, the scheduler part was uh, uh, it developed in continue of the uh, earlier project on the Kubernetes community. It's called the, the name was Cube Batch. Uh, but besides uh, the scheduler, we also build the uh, controllers to support the uh, batch job uh, definition and also like the queue concept to make uh, it easier for uh, people to move their uh, workloads uh, in from like Yarn, uh, uh, Hadoop, Spark, uh, or to the uh, uh, HPC batch systems to uh, Kubernetes based uh, the cloud native system. So it was uh, donated to uh, CNCF in uh, April 2020. And it's now, uh, uh, it now has uh, over, uh, 270 uh, contributors from all over the world. Uh, we release every three months and uh, the latest uh, version is uh, 1.3. The, uh, the major uh, uh, aspects the Volcano uh, focusing to provide is the uh, first, uh, the rich advanced scheduling, scheduling policy. For example, uh, gun scheduling and the bean packing and the uh, backfill. And also uh, we support the DRF, uh, domain uh, resource uh, fair sharing and also the hierarchical DRF. And also we provide uh, the, we actually use the uh, Volcano job concept to provide integration with uh, Spark, Link and also the, the uh, TensorFlow 
I touch, et cetera, that are running on, uh, on Kubernetes. Actually, you can just use Volcano job instead of the uh, uh, operators for each framework. So that's kind of uh, helping to simplify the uh, operator uh, management. And also, uh, actually, for uh, the scheduling uh, part, actually, uh, Volcano is scheduling from the job level, uh, not just a pod level. So it uh, makes a more awareness about the, uh, the relationship of the pods inside one job or even between jobs. So that makes it uh, more easier to do, for example, uh, for example, uh, I want to uh, have my, uh, at least uh, for example, par partly of the parts of my job running, then the others can be uh, spin up later on, or I need exactly the, uh, the right number of parts scheduled uh, uh, together also, uh, also, uh, we have the queue concept. So, uh, you can just uh, queue the uh, jobs and uh, for different users and uh, share fair share the resource uh, between queues. And also, uh, for the underlying uh, heterogeneous uh, device support, we currently uh, support both x86 and ARM, and also uh, we uh, have implementation of the GPU sharing. And also in, uh, recently we are working on to provide the new more support, new more uh, uh, scheduling support to help the workload running more uh, efficiently by taking, uh, by making use of the uh, under underlying uh, feature, uh, device features. So uh, actually, uh, from the uh, feature key feature perspective, uh, Volcano basically have uh, three aspects. One is that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Volcano makes it, makes it easier to support uh, different types of workloads running uh, uh, on top of Kubernetes. And especially uh, we have the queue-based uh, job management, queue-based uh, workload management, uh, that one makes it possible to uh, implement like the uh, time-based multiplexing and and also the time-based uh, scheduling. And also we can uh, do a more dynamic resource planning or, or resource sharing according to the queues. Even the, the uh, load may we need to run in uh, like three hours later, we can uh, just uh, queue it for now. Uh, that's much easier for uh, people when doing the uh, the AI training or or uh, doing the research. And also uh, for the uh, scheduling uh, perspective, we uh, provided a lot of uh, advanced scheduling policies like the uh, job level uh, preemption and. Uh, uh, preemption and the priority, and also uh, the uh, we support uh, scheduling based on uh, the all the topology uh, inside one job, and also uh, uh, the scheduling can be I/O aware to uh, optimize the uh, running efficiency. For example, to reduce the uh, data trans uh, transmission uh, latency. Uh, by collocating the pods together uh, in, in a certain set of uh, rack or even machine. And also uh, we support like the uh, remote shuffle service. And also uh, uh, we have some, we are working on some uh, uh, data oriented uh, job scheduling optimization and uh, resource uh, reservation and uh, backfilling. Uh, we, we currently start uh, uh, support the basic uh, from the uh, job level and uh, in the longer term, we will uh, provide more uh, advanced reservation. And also uh, the fair sharing and the priority scheduling, especially from the uh, 
job level and the application level is uh, is uh, supported. And also, we are working on to uh, to uh, implement the uh, prediction based dynamic scheduling. So to uh, uh, to trigger the scheduling and the resource uh, reallocation uh, from a, a future time perspective. So uh, just to give some uh, quick example that uh, how Volcano can uh, help improve the uh, TensorFlow distributed uh, training. So here is a, a, a test case that we have. Uh, the first one is that uh, we have one job with two parameter servers and the four workers. So actually uh, for the test cases or, the uh, the assumption is that, uh, for example, the resources of uh, GPU are always uh, limited. We always have uh, more uh, workload to run uh, regarding the uh, the resources we have. So how to uh, make the whole uh, execution time uh, shorter and uh, make sure. Uh, Every time the resource allocation is uh, is, uh, is useful, is the uh, this is the goal we want to achieve. So, case one, uh, just I said, one one job with two PS and uh, four workers. So you can see actually, uh, because the resource is enough, so uh, so the uh, we don't have any uh, different comparing to the. Uh, Cube flow with uh, the Kubernetes default scheduler, but when there are, uh, for example, the two uh, jobs with the uh, same uh, PS and the workers, and because the now the resources uh, become not enough to run them uh, in parallel at the same time, so uh, one job would stay uh, waiting for a long time, and uh, we in this situation, uh, how to make at least one job uh, able to run uh, first uh, is what we uh, is the uh, advantage of the uh, gun scheduling. So uh, we know that uh, in the TensorFlow training, if we don't have enough uh, workers or we don't have enough uh, PS the parameter servers. Uh, it may not able to start uh, training, right? So, and if we increase the number of jobs to uh, five, because there are more jobs waiting for the resources. And if you are using the default scheduler because it's scheduling part by part, so uh, no uh, awareness of the up layer uh, job, so maybe you get one part of each job's schedule, and then the deadlock is very easy to occur in the cluster. And in 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 most uh, cases, according to our test, only two jobs can be uh, completed. So that's why uh, gun scheduling is the actually the most important uh, when running. The distributed training, uh, training in uh, on Kubernetes on top of Kubernetes, and also another uh, 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 example of the optimization is that we know that uh, in the distributed training, the the data uh, access is very heavy. So uh, with Volcano uh, I/O aware. Uh, Feature we can uh, reduce the data transmission uh, delay by uh, properly placing the uh, right part, especially the 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 part from of same uh, TensorFlow job together. So here are also the uh, the test case is that we have three jobs. Okay, uh, each job has two uh, PS and four workers. And again, the goal is to uh, to uh, reduce the total execution time. Right. Uh, so 
you can see in, in this, um, yeah, you can see in this diagram, the, uh, the, this column, the origin is the, actually the result of the uh, running the workloads uh, on top of Kubernetes with default schedule, okay? The second column is that we enable the, the task topology. So task topology means that uh, we just uh, roughly think that the worker node and the PS from the save TensorFlow uh, deployment, they they have some uh, data, uh, data access uh, uh, across each other. So task topology is trying to pull them together each by each on the same uh, rack from the rack level or, or the, uh, from the node level. And the, the IO aware is, IO aware is actually uh, uh, enables user to define like which two parts they have the, uh, the IO uh, dependency, the data access. And only to, uh, uh, Volcano will only uh, put these uh, related parts together. So uh, this uh, is kind of uh, also balancing the co-location and the resource distribution. Because if you are uh, roughly uh, enabling the task topology, some of the uh, job or parts may be waiting. And also the implementation uh, is uh, kind of a uh, different aspect uh, from the scheduler view. So it reduced the, the dependency of part affinity and uh, part anti affinity. We optimized the, the uh, algorithm implementation. So uh, the overall scheduler performance is improved. So uh, that's why you can see in the IO where enabled mode, uh, the total execution time is very short. And the uh, third one is uh, we uh, taking the Spark uh, into uh, uh, consideration that we in, in improve the, the Spark execution uh, performance with uh, the main resource uh, definition. So uh, actually the, the use case is to, uh, to run the uh, Spark query uh, in, in parallel at the same time. Uh, so uh, on the left is the uh, the resource, the, the cluster setup of the uh, test. And according to the test, uh, if there's no uh, fixed uh, driver nodes, because the driver nodes are just the uh, normal ports, uh, uh, taking from, uh, seeing, looking from the uh, Kubernetes aspect, yeah, the driver nodes are just the, uh, Spark driver nodes are just the uh, normal ports. So they will not uh, fix them uh, onto a certain uh, Kubernetes node. They just uh, schedule with the others, right? And with that uh, uh, model, up to uh, 26 query can run concurrently in the same time. Um, but with uh, Volcano, we can easily uh, use the, uh, the Volcano job definition to uh, to define the main uh, resource for running the uh, run, run, running the Spark uh, clusters, and over uh, almost uh, thirty percent of the uh, uh, overall improve uh, performance improvement was achieved. Yeah, that that's what that was uh, benefiting from the resource uh, reservation because we can resource some uh, uh, reserve some uh, resource to run the uh, spark uh, drivers uh, that's easier in the uh, resource allocation uh, uh, in, in the time period to get a better uh, result okay and also uh, Running uh, MPI workloads, uh, Volcano, uh, we also provided some um, plugins to simplify that. Uh, we know that uh, the MPI uh, workload is kind of uh, step by step, and also they sometimes uh, sometimes need to uh, SSH from one 
uh, uh, worker node to another work node to do some uh, uh, some operation. That's why we uh, we provided the uh, SSH uh, plugin to simplify the, uh, the communication uh, between each other. So you don't uh, you don't need to define how to inject the SSH key or and also uh, we have the uh, service plugin. You can define the underlying the network in the, uh, information, how to find the other uh, workers, work, uh, worker nodes. And uh, yeah, and also uh, in the MPI uh, workload running, we know that uh, especially uh, in, in, in a lot of cases, if one or, or more uh, uh, worker node uh, crash, uh, the whole uh, job need to be restarted. So we also define that the uh, the policies that if any part get evicted, uh, we need to restart the whole job. All right. Uh, the tasks are uh, just uh, for defining the uh, each, actually the each uh, worker node you want to run uh, of the uh, the MPI workload. Okay. So. Uh, Today, uh, people are uh, using uh, Volcano, uh, benefiting mostly from the uh, schedule, Volcano scheduling, because uh, there are still uh, a lot of uh, workloads may be defined uh, by the other uh, abstractions. For example, people, uh, some users are running a Volcano together with Kubeflow, with the TF operator, and also maybe with the, uh, uh, the Spark operator and also the other uh, operator, that's fine because uh, Volcano, uh, we kind of uh, make the our uh, functionalities uh, easy to combine or to uh, offer uh, individually. So you can just uh, either run uh, scheduler or you can run uh, the volcano job and the queue together with the scheduler. So we have basically we have the concept of uh, job. The job here is the volcano job, and also the definition of the pod group. Uh, if you are not using a volcano job, you can also just uh, add a notation to the pods created by other workload abstractions in, in the pod template to define which uh, set of port belongs to the same part group. And Volcano actually can help you to make this part group schedule together, like to achieve down scheduling or uh, consider uh, fair sharing between different uh, groups. So inside the uh, scheduling implementation, actually the uh, we made it a very uh, uh, extensible framework. So uh, the the most of the most basic part is the caching. We uh, we the job info here is kind of a uh, a scheduler uh, internal concept. So you you don't need to care much about it. So basically, uh, we we cache the things and start the session and to compute basically schedule all the uh, pods, the, the, the pod groups uh, at the period of time and, uh, and then uh, submit the result in a batch. So that's why it's actually a batch scheduling system. And also the like the in queue uh, allocate these things here are uh, the actions. So uh, in uh, by default we uh, have in, enabled like the uh, in queue for queue management and uh, uh, allocate for our resource allocation and uh, preempt to taking uh, the priority and the preemption uh, functionality into consideration and also uh, reclaim to uh, and the backfilling to uh, to adjust the, the uh, resource allocation when at the scheduling time to to uh, balance between the uh, resource priority and the fair sharing stuff. And uh, uh, 
if you have uh, uh, additional requirements, you can definitely very easy to uh, extend to implement extra actions and just uh, plug it into the uh, scheduler. You can get uh, extra uh, step to do your own work. And also the plugins here are kind of set of uh, a set of uh, fundamental uh, algorithms. So they will be uh, uh, called during the actions. For example, you, you are moving from uh, Yarn to, uh, to uh, Kubernetes. You uh, previously, your workload may be oh, uh, relying on the DRF uh, algorithm heavily. So uh, the DRF plugin here is uh, ready to help you to just uh, get the same uh, experience of the, uh, the job scheduling and the resource allocation on, on top of uh, Kubernetes. Yeah, and also the uh, gun scheduling and the priority and the other uh, plugins, uh, you, you can also uh, enable uh, load the plugins according to your own uh, environment, your own requirement. So it's very uh, highly uh, extensible um, design of the scheduler. So um, uh, today, actually, uh, Volcano, uh, after entering CNCF, we uh, get the very uh, 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 faster growing in the in the community. So uh, now we have over uh, 50 adopters uh, all over the world. And some of the uh, uh, maybe well-known adopters here, uh, you can see there are cloud companies and the, uh, the internet companies and also the, uh, the e-commerce companies and the financial companies and also the uh, 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 research organizations and uh, the bioinformatic uh, companies. So uh, from the uh, uh, contributor perspective in the last one year, uh, we cannot get very uh, good diversity on the uh, code contribution. You can see that uh, even Huawei is the, uh, the, uh, the funding organization, but uh, the Overwork contribution from over uh, the community uh, uh, are taking very uh, uh, big per uh, percentage. Okay, so I will just uh, go through some of the uh, real world use case, how a volcano uh, benefits uh, people's uh, uh, services. So uh, this one is the uh, AI platform at Xiaohongshu. So, so Xiaohongshu is one of the top social media and uh, e-commerce uh, uh, company in China. It has uh, over 100 million uh, active users every month, uh, per month. So uh, in their uh, business, the recommendation is uh, one of the most important services. So they need to run the, and they are using the AI technology to, uh, to do the uh, online and uh, uh, offline training every day and with a very uh, heavy uh, load. So currently they have hundreds of thousands of uh, samples uh, analysis and the model training. And the model generation has already been on the uh, minute scale. The challenging thing is that uh, the, the, they are actually uh, running the training on a very large uh, cluster, uh, have uh, thousands of nodes. And the, the recommendation model, they have nearly 100 billion parameters. So the training uh, workload is very heavy. And uh, one single training task consists, uh, contains of hundreds of uh, parameter servers and uh, workers. And also the, uh, they want to achieve the best uh, topology scheduling and the end-to-end uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, performance. Uh, that's why, uh, 
Uh, and actually, they did some investment and uh, fund uh, Volcano, actually, the uh, Cube batch in early days. And uh, uh, well, uh, Volcano was definitely a more powerful uh, solution uh, compared to the uh, just the Cube batch uh, scheduling in early days. So uh, they adopted the uh, uh, whole architecture on top of uh, Volcano uh, with uh, Kubernetes. So here is the uh, diagram. Basically, you can see the, how uh, everything goes. So uh, the the end, the real end user is actually uh, people just stay using the uh, apps on the cell phone, and they uh, they will get some uh, input data. And first of all, they need to label label the data, and also use the uh, flink to to. Uh, for example, uh, do some uh, processing about the data and then load it to uh, for the uh, model training. And then after the uh, uh, training uh, finish, uh, they will release the model and uh, to update the uh, recommendation service and uh, update the uh, online service. Okay, uh, for the uh, uh, final benefit so far, uh, it's increased about 20% uh, of the uh, AI training end-to-end uh, uh, -end speed and also increased the uh, throughput. So it means that uh, the, 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 the training jobs in concurrency uh, increased 20% uh, and also avoid a lot of uh, the big job starvation uh, in, 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 during the uh, training. So we know that, uh, for example, with especially with uh, uh, vanilla Kubernetes, uh, big parts may uh, uh, harder to get uh, scheduled because uh, the, uh, uh, due to the fragmentation of the uh, resources, and also especially from uh, a job level, it's even uh, harder because uh, there may be always some of the uh, smaller parts get scheduled and you cannot uh, actually guarantee the whole big job get scheduled at the same time in a, in, in a very uh, distributed system. Okay, uh, the uh, second uh, use case is the uh, deep learning platform at the uh, ICE.com. So ICE uh, is the uh, one of the uh, top online video uh, platform in China. Uh, it has over 500 million uh, monthly active uh, users. So, and also uh, people uh, nearly spend uh, 6 billion hours uh, on its service. So the, the deep learning platform is uh, to helping them to uh, train the model of advertising and the uh, searching recommendation and also the NLP. The challenging thing is that actually uh, in the early days, the whole system uh, was built on top of uh, Mesos with Marathon. So uh, they are uh, trying to uh, take advantage of the container management to get the highly scalable uh, architecture. Uh, but the challenge is that they, uh, they have the mixed resource need to be scheduled. And then on top of their own platform, the different uh, business team, they use uh, different uh, framework, including the TensorFlow PyTorch and also Cafe, Cafe 1 and 2, and also the MXNet. So how to simplify, how to deal with uh, the different workload running on top of the same software stack is uh, very challenging. And also uh, we know that Kubernetes become more and more uh, successful uh, uh, during the years uh, comparing to uh, Mesos and the Marathon. So definitely uh, people need to uh, to uh, transfer from cloud uh, transfer from the uh, Mesos to cloud native. 
So how uh, the solution is that, uh, you know, that uh, Volcano Java can uh, provide the definition to support running uh, multiple types of the uh, AI frameworks. So, so they make use of the Volcano job to, uh, to have the common abstraction of each type of uh, framework. And also they uh, made use of the uh, queue-based scheduling to keep the fair sharing among uh, different business teams. And also uh, uh, make use of part group to define the scheduling to make sure uh, the uh, uh, make sure uh, the resource allocation can immediately uh, help the framework load the uh, data to start training. So currently, this uh, uh, the, the, this architecture they have moved it uh, to uh, Volcano for uh, more than one year, and the whole system are running in 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 production very well. Okay. Um, the next one is the uh, uh, the batch uh, batch computing platform at uh, retain investment. So the investment is uh, retain investment is one of the financial uh, top financial investment in company in China. They have a, a very uh, heavy analysis and uh, AI training uh, every day. So. Uh, for the financial, we know that uh, they, uh, for day to day, you need to collect the uh, the new informations and the new data to do some uh, analysis and generate the reports. And also, uh, the the retail investment they are using uh, the uh, AI uh, technology to do some uh, uh, automatic. Uh, Buying and uh, sell, sell, selling out, so they need to. Uh, uh, the key is they need to uh, keep improving their AI and also the analysis uh, speed to make sure uh, they uh, react faster uh, uh, comparing to the other uh, to comparing to the others in in, in the market. So actually, uh, in the early days, they were uh, using uh, Yarn to run the whole uh, uh, platform, and they are relying uh, very much on the fair sharing of the uh, resources and also the uh, gun scheduling to uh, to avoid the uh, load deadlock, and also because they uh, have both uh, AI training and big data and the the uh, batch tasks they need they need the mixed scheduling of all of them and to improve the uh, the resource utility. So uh, with Volcano uh, actually helped them to uh, speed up the uh, transition from the uh, yarn to Kubernetes uh, based architecture and also currently. Uh, they are running uh, more than 300,000 pods uh, every day to do the uh, analysis and uh, the uh, AI training. Okay, so uh, that's all about the uh, introduction and uh, Volcano currently we, we uh, are actively uh, developing on GitHub and we have the Slack channel. We also have the uh, weekly community meeting. So uh, uh, definitely uh, welcome everyone to join and to have a try and uh, uh, give us your uh, feedback. Okay, that's all my uh, presentation. Thank you. Okay, cool. Very, very good. Uh, very complete. Now I do have a couple of questions. We don't have a ton of time, but I do have a couple of things that I wanted to ask. 
So okay. in in the process of doing this, um, what have been the, the biggest challenges and difficulties that you've had, both when you were getting started, and then I'd like to know a little bit about, about iterations that you may have made once you got in contact with the adopters and seeing how it was working, we can say on the ground for them. Yeah, actually, the in the early days, uh, I think uh, it's more from the community building perspective. Yeah, because uh, Volcano, uh, uh, the main thing we offer is the scheduling and also the uh, the the CRD for uh, the workload the definition. Mm -hmm. uh, when we start this project, actually, the uh, Cube Flow and also like the Spark operators. They already got some uh, users, and uh, uh, some users they don't want uh, change in a short time uh, before they get uh, uh, enough information to help them make the decision. So that's why uh, actually we are just uh, uh, offering the uh, scheduling, the, the functionality with the scheduler. So uh, I think that one of the challenges is that in the early days, how to get the uh, uh, get the, the 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 early day users to try out Volcano, and uh, what we did is actually we uh, 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 we we joined the uh, Kubeflow community uh, because there are a lot of uh, uh, users there, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, collect the, the requirements from them, and also uh, and also actually. Uh, we provide after we finished the, the integration of uh, Kubeflow and Volcano, we added the document to Kubeflow uh, document. So uh, definitely, a lot of people can just uh, try there with the uh, example the TF operator together with Volcano to achieve the uh, scheduling, and that actually helps a lot to to uh, to uh, to find the early day uh, users. Which I think is a challenge for a lot of people is like you said, how do you convince them that yeah. this isn't gonna be super complex, we're gonna be here with the right amount of support. I think there's always a bit of trial and error in that in that element. Then you said, so with, with 50 adopters and, and looking at different sectors, what have, what have been the learnings from that as well in the sense of, has it been different depending on the sector in which uh, the adopter is working? Do you notice patterns across sectors? What's that experience been like? So actually, there are uh, from now. Actually, uh, we can see the uh, end users. They kind of have some uh, uh, models. For example, uh, a set of the uh, end users they are running the uh, AI workload on Kubernetes, mm -hmm. and some are running the big data on Kubernetes, and the other may be running on the, the HPC on, on Kubernetes. So. Uh, for example, the big data, uh, we after we uh, discussed uh, with some of them, we found that a lot of are trying to uh, transition from the uh, uh, the early days architecture to cloud native, because uh, like the Yarn, the Hadoop, they they are they are kind of uh, dedicated uh, setup. They cannot benefit from uh, putting all things together to improve the. Uh, uh, resource utility. So, uh, but also when uh, we know that when people are doing some transition, they are kind of uh, not willing to do a lot of change, especially the, 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 the deployment, right? The, yeah. the, the, the setup stuff. They are more like uh, likely focusing on just their business. So uh, that's why we are porting a lot of uh, Metric the equivalent functionality of Yarn to the uh, Kubernetes uh, with Volcano uh, architecture to make sure people can get uh, same experience or at least a very similar experience before and after they uh, they change the, the underlying stack. That's a great. Then that's, they, a, that's really interesting. Sorry, yeah, sorry to interrupt. That's really interesting though, because like you said, is that people have that experience outside Kubernetes. And then in Kubernetes are expecting the same thing. If those expectations aren't met, then I'm going to go look for a competitor. I'm not going to try this at all. So there's a certain amount of pressure there. Um, and also a lot of understanding user experience, developer experience, however we want to think about it. I think that part's really interesting too, because while there is a very strong technical component, there's a very yeah. strong human experience based component. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. Also, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. 
Yeah, so what we did is actually we also uh, took a deep look into the uh, the uh, YARN implementation and the feature set and think about how we can uh, port. Uh, we are not actually uh, uh, just uh, porting the exactly the, uh, uh, the, the, the original thing. Uh, we are still have our own thinking during the porting and what a kind of uh, change people are willing to do because actually uh, the goal is that we want to people to try out more uh, new things from the from native technology. Know that the, the running in, in containers and outside containers are definitely different, yeah. right? And also the, the, the model uh, is different uh, and we need to change the idea that uh, containers are highly easily gone in any of the time. We need to uh, 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 be kind of uh, uh, aware of that. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And I think it's also what's interesting with that is because, you know, when you're talking about big data technologies, uh, you know, now going back, uh, you know, in, in previous companies, when, you know, Hadoop and Spark and Elastic and all these technologies were being used by a lot of folks for uh, the first time, although of course, you know, they, they do stretch back farther. It seemed like this was going to be permanent, you know, like this is how it's going to be forever. But it, what technology teaches us is that we're always going through phases. And an interesting thing too, uh, a couple of days ago, having a live stream and talking about the differences between technologies like Argo and Airflow. And Airflow is a great technology, but it's not Kubernetes native. And that doesn't mean you can't use it on Kubernetes, but it just means that there are certain things you're going to have to keep in mind. Whereas Argo is far more Kubernetes native. So very much built in with that kind of mentality. People talk, and so I think with every, every technology, a lot of people, yeah, don't want to have to learn a new one. So how can I, how can I shift that on there and, and be able to get the, the same kind of an experience? That's a challenge. Um, I'm curious though as well too, you met, you talked a fair amount about CRDs. And one time one of our community members said that CRD is his uh, custom resource definition is his favorite uh, Kubernetes feature. Do you have a Kubernetes feature? And if so, which one? Oh, uh, you mean my favorite? Yeah, Kubernetes. favorite feature, yeah. Uh, actually, maybe not uh, exactly any feature, but I, I actually like the Kubernetes design very much. I'm a big fan of the Kubernetes design because uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, very, very uh, uh, smart design that you can see. It's actually very easy for contributors to start contributing Kubernetes. Like in the early days, I actually, I don't have much scheduling background at time when I started contributing to Kubernetes, but the code is kind of layered very clearly that the underlying framework are very uh, focusing on, for example, the list watch and the API machinery and the upper layer, they are all kind of plugins. Mm -hmm. uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can customize the uh, controller uh, in, 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 the, in the component level, or you can uh, use take advantage of the uh, plugins. For example, admission, uh, people have uh, a lot of admission web hook today, right? In the early days, we just uh, implement admission controller inside of the code, uh, code repository. And also for uh, the scheduler, you can find out the, the Kubernetes, uh, even though uh, it's, uh, more focusing on the service scheduling, but actually Kubernetes scheduler design is very beautiful. They simplify the model and you can almost plug in any uh, algorithm into the uh, 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 Kubernetes scheduler because they are just a, a filtering uh, period and the scoring period. So you can, if you have any other uh, resources, needed to aware, you can uh, easily plug in. Yeah, I mm -hmm. think the, the the architecture is my favorite. That's really cool. And also that's that's not necessarily a common answer that we might get. And I think that that says a lot about also, once again, 
someone who has over half a decade of experience working with on Kubernetes and has seen that growth and evolution. And also when you think about it, in those six years, how many thousands of contributors have gone in? And now that I think of it, it's almost like if you imagine the amount of people that are working on Kubernetes, working on virtually any you know physical project, if we want to think about building a house or a city or a garden or things like that, what that would look like and all the different efforts and angles that have gone into that design. That's a really cool way to think about it. Um, and also I think too, is that the, the contributor experience uh, as well, you very well know, uh, yeah. I, I haven't been in that many other open source projects, so I can't speak to them. But I would say that it's very positive. It's very welcoming. There's lots of support, documentation, tons of different ways to get involved. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna take that design one because that's a really that's a really interesting thing to think about. Good. Um, well, we don't have uh, much more time for today, but Kevin, thank you very much. Uh, we'll definitely keep you on our radar. Definitely gonna have Volcano on our radar from now on as well. Uh, we'll be sharing the live stream on on Twitter for anybody who who happened to get here a little bit late. Uh, also, there was some great stuff in the slides, particularly at the end, the resources for folks to, if you want to continue that, obviously as well, you have the Volcano community, Slack, you can jump in there and start conversations there too. Um, Kevin, anything else you'd like to mention before we finish? Uh, that's all uh, today. Thank you for uh, having me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Total pleasure. Thanks a lot, Kevin. We'll see you soon.